So, we are discussing the axiomatic system F c for the first order logic. Then along with the axioms we had now two inference rules unlike your P c, P c had only one the same we have kept as M p plus another for universal generalization. And in the axioms we have all the three axioms of P c plus there are some more. So, two more for the quantifier and two more for the equality predicate right. So, that is how we started. Then we proved two theorems monotonicity and deduction theorem. Then just like your P c you can also formulate reductio ad absurdum the same formulation the same proof right because there is nothing much there anyway just we tell them what it is. So, you have one uh, consequence to be proved sigma n tells x in that case what you do is add not x as a new premise and then so that sigma union not x is inconsistent right and this process is reversible if sigma union not x is inconsistent then you say that sigma n tells x fine this is your reductio ad absurdum basically. Then let us apply all those meta theorems in proving some of the theorems. In fact, we will not prove them as theorems because we are not going to give a proof of that directly. So, that means we will show that it is provable fine. So, which means you take some uh, formula and then may be using some reduction order of Saddam or deduction theorem you transfer it to some other consequence then give a proof of the consequence because of the meta theorems the original formula is provable as a theorem right that will be the approach. So, let us see example 1 which is really propositional right x implies not y implies not of x implies y there is no quantifier involved directly though they are now from formulas from F c not propositions necessarily right even for any formulas you have the reduction ad absurdum and the deduction theorem. So, you can apply and get it done fine one easy way to look at it is see you have the law of contraposition right. So, if you can prove x implies x implies y implies y then it is done right if you use law of contraposition even without using it you can do because you have R a right. So, let us try that way say first is by deduction theorem it is enough to prove x n tells not y implies not of x implies y fine. Then you say again another application of deduction theorem says x not y n tells not of x implies y right. Then with reduction ad absurdum if so x not y and x implies y that is inconsistent ok. Then you say again by reduction ad absurdum. x x implies y n tells y right you now choose this one as your formula which has come from the consequence if you look from this to this you will see easily not y is added and that is inconsistent right and there is nothing to prove here it is mp right for which you can give a proof say x x implies y therefore y or just give this is a premise, this is a premise, this is modus ponens that is all. Is it clear? So, this contribution has been proved inside it. This is not new to you, huh? the same technique of P c that is what we have done ok. Is it clear? We proceed to next example. So, here we have for each x, x equal to f of y implies q x then you show that q f of y again deduction theorem might be handy. So, let us say by deduction theorem we just show for each x, x equal to f of y implies q x 
and tells q f of y. Right? Now, this can be shown, it is easy to show here. Just what you have to do is take a suitable instantiation of this universally quantified variable. Right? So, we start with our premise for each x, x equal to f of y implies q of x, that is the premise. Okay? Next, one axiom for instantiation. So, x equal to f of y implies q x implies f of y equal to f of y implies q of f of y. Right? Is that okay? For each x x implies x x by t. Is that right? So, this gives you which axiom? f of Next, use MP to get f of y equal to f of y implies q f of y. Next, use another axiom, equality axiom, and then mode exponents. Okay, so I leave it there. This is which axiom again? Just to remember them. Three were from PC, two were from universal. Next one, right? A six, and then an application of MP finishes it. Clear? So let's try next example. For each x, x implies y implies not for each x, not x, which is really your there is x x, and you given in that form. That's also fine. You can use the definitions and reduce it to this one. Finally, this is to be proved. So, this will say for each x, x implies y implies there is x, x implies there is x, y. Right? So, again we use deduction theorem. This says for each x, x implies y and tells not for each x, not x implies not for each x, not y. Here itself you can use contraposition, right? By contraposition it is enough. But contraposition we can't use here. It has to be used inside the proof again. Only meta theorems we can use outside the proofs. So then let's uh, use again deduction theorem, which says for each x, x implies y, and not for each x, not x, and tells not for each x not y. Okay. Next use array, because this not will be difficult to use as a premise. Fine. So, we take for each x, x implies y, not for each x not x along with for each x not y is inconsistent. Okay. Once we use array to take that negation to the other side, so we say for each x, x implies y, for each x not y and tells for each x not x. Now, you see contribution has been used through array. We should be able to prove this. Hmm? It does not look to be more simplified than this. So, let us try a proof for each x, x implies y premise, for each x not y premise. Next, well, we can just say x implies y, and similarly, in fact, it did not go in one stage, 
axioms have to be used and then MP has to be used it has to be brought right. So what we do is for each x, x implies y implies x implies y that is axiom 4 okay then MP which will give you x implies y. two steps will be required right. So, similarly another two steps will give you not y okay there you will be using P C. So, this comes from again same way you can fill it up next 7 will be not x right then over Universally generalized for each x not x. Is that okay? So eighth line will be for each x not x. Huge. All that you have to see is x is not free in the premises, which is not. In no premise it's free. So even used thus far, whatever it is, x is free. X is not free. In all the premises used till now. So, for each x not x clear now next one. So, by deduction theorem we have not for each x x implies y and tells for each x not of x implies y. Right? Now, some mental block how to use this not Well, you use array, transfer it to the other side, see what happens. So, this gives by array not for each x x implies y and then not of this this is inconsistent. Right. Then again, array which gives not for each x, not x implies y, and tells for each x x implies y. Fine. Okay. Then use deduction theorem, which says not for each x not of x implies y for each x x and tells y clear again this not is again with for each. So, you have to take it inside you can take not y also. So, R a will give for each x x not y and tells for each x not of x implies y twice huh? so I have used it twice right not y comes here which is inconsistent right then I take it to the other side by r a again. So, for each x x not y and tells this clear now probably this will be easier to show. Hmm? So, one you have for each x x then second or rather third line hmm? use axiom 4 for each x x implies x next use mode exponents to get x both will be used. Is that okay? Second line will be for each x x implies x. That is our axiom four. Then modus ponens on these two to get x. So after you get x, you have not y. Premise. Now, what is your target?
for each x not of x implies y. So, this can be obtained by universal generalization u g. So, you want to get this now that is propositional which is our example 1 right. So, use example 1 as a theorem previously proved theorem then used mode exponents with x you get not y implies not of x implies y again mode exponents with not y right. So, you get not of x implies y. Huh? You prove it. You will have to prove it. No? So, once you see that x and not y gives not of x implies y, right. So, that is really a PC theorem, it is a PC consequence. So, you can always bluff it is PC and then continue. <laughs> Fine. But then it need not be a theorem, so better prove it. <laughs> is that okay? But it can be done some other way, your bluff might be correct. See, there is there is one nice thing how to prove the trigonometrical identities. There is a nice algorithm to prove them, which you never know in our high schools, otherwise, we would have scored 100 percent. Huh? See, the algorithm is suppose there is a trigonometrical identity left side equal to right side, you know it is an identity. Right. It is given in the book, so it must be identity. So, what you do is start left side writing whatever identity you know go on applying it hmm. and here from the bottom you start from the right side whatever you know go on filling it leave it there. <laughs> right. And it is not wrong right whatever you get in between that is correct identity. <laughs> Is that okay? So it depends on how much you have to spare in the paper. <laughs> Continue. So the same way you can leave it here. You know that x, not y, should give you not of x implies y semantically, because x, not y, both are there. It is equivalent to x and not y, and not of x implies y is equivalent to x and not y. So it should be provable because it is complete system. PC is complete. So, there is a proof of it, right. But what the proof exactly is, you do not know. So, leave it theorem, PC theorem. <laughs> but better to prove it, and we have proved in example 1, okay. So, that means it will give after some steps. Let me write it some 8 star, I do not know whether it is 8th or 9th. <laughs> so, there you get not of x implies y, then we use ug. So, that gives you for each x not of x implies y. Then let us see this. See with not of a equal to b, it is not easy to get, right. So, use r a from the beginning. So, by r a, we try to show p a for each x, p x implies q x for each x r x implies not q x and r b and a equal to b is inconsistent. Now, with a equal to b it should be possible right, but there are constants a and b. So, you do not know which one we will instantiate if you instantiate wrongly you may not get that fine. So, we do not know exactly whether we will get not p a or not r b or even not q a or not q b something which will bring the inconsistency that is not very clear now that always happens whenever there are instantiations. Earlier what happened earlier cases of r a there was no instantiation. So, they are almost proportional everything should be possible. But now there is instantiation and a equal to b. So, I do not know which one I will be able to derive, not p i will be able to derive or not r b, which will contradict, or q a, not q a, q b, not q b. I do not know which one. So, let us keep it in this form and continue towards deriving inconsistency, right. Okay. Now, I start from say for each x, 
P x implies Q x. This is the premise. So, third line, second line I want to use my P a, right. Since I want to use my P a, I want to instantiate it. So, write in the second line for each x, P x implies Q x implies P a implies Q a, right. It is axiom 4, a 4 then use mode exponents to get in the third line P a implies Q a right. So, a 4 and mode exponents ok. Then I can use P a as the premise and get by mode exponents Q a. Right, but here I have R A not Q X. Anyway, I can use R A still because I have already Q A. Or for R B, I can use B also. Any one of the instantiations will do. Okay, which one will go? A or B? With B, okay, fine. Then sixth one, introduce the premise for each X. R X implies not Q X. Then again eighth line will be R B implies not Q B. Okay. Then you have ninth line as R B that is a premise. So, seventh line I have left it that is axiom 4. So, you should have justification here as A 4 and M P. Right? you have to fill it up do not leave it like this. Then ninth is R B. So, I get in the tenth line not Q B by modus ponens. Fine. Then A equal to B has to be used. So, eleventh line is A equal to B premise twelfth. Huh? We have already Q A, we have not Q B. A equal to B that should give the contradiction, right? That should bring in inconsistency. So you have to use A seven. Huh? A equal to B implies Q A implies Q B. X S equal to T. X X by S x x by t. So, our x is q x. Fine. This is a 7. Then mode exponents. So, that gives q a implies q b and we have already q a q a is which line? Fifth line. So we just have QB. That's the end of the proof. Right? You have to write a line. Where is the inconsistency? Right? So inconsistency is proved due to formulas in lines. Not Q B is in ten, ten and four ten. Clear? So it's easy now. How the proofs will be going? So the next concern will be whether this system really captures F C or not. Right? It does capture, and we will not do the proof now. Proof again follows the same line as that of P C to P L. Right? It is sound. It is easy to see because all the inference rules are the valid consequences in F L and all the axioms are really valid uh, formulas in F L. Therefore, it is sound by induction. Okay. So, soundness is easy, completeness will be a bit difficult because here you have to instantiate with all the terms. 
So, there is potentially infinite number of terms. So, for all instant senses you have to consider the formulas. Whenever there is some for each x x you have to really consider x substituted by all possible terms. All those formulas have to be extended in order to get one maximally consistent set, because that is our approach to go to one maximally consistent set. So, to get that you have to really add all these instantiations that makes it difficult, but then it can be done, because all of them are countable. So, they can be enumerated the same procedure still can be used. Okay. So, we will not prove that, but we will mention. So, F c is adequate to F n. So, which really means you have two results soundness and completeness. So, soundness you can say sigma n tells in F c x then sigma semantically enters x in f l that is your soundness and completeness is the converse of it. If sigma semantically enters in f l x then sigma enters in f c x for any set of formula sigma and any formula x which you can write also with redox or absurdum in a different way, right. Once you show that it is adequate, you can prove something else, like can you generate all the theorems in F L, all the valid formulas in F L. Suppose first order logic is there, you know what are the formulas, you have the laws but they are only the basic laws. Then there are so many others, infinitely many valid formulas are there. Can you generate all the valid formulas by using the laws? There is no completeness there, we are in semantic domain now. Well, since F c is complete, it is enough to say by using the axioms and the rules of inference of F c, can you generate all the valid formulas? Yes, because that is the definition of a theorem definition of a proof. So, what you have to do is just feed all these things to a machine and program write a program just to go on generating by following the rules whatever it is. Right? We are not asking you to prove a particular theorem, we are just asking it to go on generating by all possible theorems. Right? So, it generates so one by one it gives you. Right? So, that means the set of all theorems of F c is recursively enumerable. There is a program to generate all these things, it is an output of a Turing machine, right. So, it is recursively enumerable. Since it captures all the valid formulas in F L, so all the valid formulas in F L set up all that is also recursively enumerable, right. There is a program to generate all the valid formulas in F L. The program is just programming of P C, implementation of P C. F C, right? Is it clear? So it is the next strong question we would ask, because it doesn't say when you will get your theorem, when you will get your valid formula to be proved. It just goes on generating on its own way, the way you have written the algorithm, right? But problem is, suppose you want to have a proof of something like this, right? That is a targeted one you did not have any target till now, you just say go on generating all the valid formulas. Now, you say whether this formula is valid or not, give a particular one, that algorithm may not work, right. If it is, then it will work, right. So, that is the problem. See, suppose you know that something, some formula is valid, now your algorithm generates all the valid formulas. So, at some finite time it will be generated. And once it is generated, it stops there. You can write another module on it, right? Use that as a module, and once this is generated, stop there. Fine. So it stops, it gives you yes, I have got a proof of it. So that means if your conjecture is true, you get a proof of it. If it is false, no idea, it may not stop at all, it can run on infinitely. 
fine. So, that is the idea of recursively enumerability, fine. If there is a targeted theorem to be proved, we do not know when we will get the proof, but we will get if it is a theorem. If it is not a theorem, it does not say anything, the algorithm need not terminate, fine. So, it is one side of our strong question that given any formula, can you decide whether it has a proof or it does not have a proof, it only answers it partially, right. And the undesirability theorem for the first order logic says that the answer to the next question is negative, right. It is not decidable at all, it is recursively enumerable, but not decidable. Means, given some valid formula, you do not know whether it is a theorem or not. Once it is a theorem, you have a proof of it. So, once you have the undecidability result, you may say this recursive enumerability is a semi decidability result, rather, because one part of it is the decidable, the other part is not decidable. That is why they are also called semi decidable problems. So, it is giving some more information to recursive enumerability. It is recursively enumerable, but not decidable, they are called semi decidable, right. So, undecidable we have not yet proved, we will see that once time comes. Hmm? Okay. But recursive enumerability it gives that is all. What about your Hofbrand interpretations for example? Suppose you do not use F c, you just go to the Hofbrand expansions. What happens there? You are given with one formula F L formula, then you compute its Hofbrand expansion, right. Now, it is potentially infinite set but infinite set of propositions. Okay. Now, suppose it is unsatisfiable, now we leave the question of validity because by duality it is enough to consider unsatisfiability. Now, suppose the formula given is unsatisfiable, then that means its observant expansion is unsatisfiable. Once it is unsatisfiable by compactness theorem for propositional logic, there is a finite set which is unsatisfiable. right? So, now let us write an algorithm, how to prove unsatisfiability from the Hervand expansion. We know there is a finite subset. So, start first one, is it unsatisfiable? Yes, stop there. If not, take the second one, ask the same question, is it unsatisfiable? If unsatisfiable, stop, otherwise add the third one, continue. If it is really unsatisfiable, it will stop somewhere and that is one finite set you have got, which is unsatisfiable. Compactness theorem guarantees that there is one finite subset, once it is unsatisfiable, right. That is why the algorithm will terminate, is that right. But if it is satisfiable, again algorithm will not terminate, it will not be able to show that it is not unsatisfiable, right. Again the same thing is coming there, unsatisfiable sentences or unsatisfiable formulas in F L are recursively enumerable. Okay. So, you can get the same result from the Hervant expansions also, but it does not say anything about the other side undecidability. Fine. So, for that you need some more results like uh, you start with a Turing machine for example. Now, any Turing machine its operation you can simulate by one first order sentence let us say first order sentences, just the way we are translating some natural language arguments, right. What you do there? Say all horses are animals, therefore, legs of horses are legs of animals. So, in this argument what you do is, you take anybody is a horse H x, anybody is an animal A x, go on symbolizing it. So, you get one consequence in first order logic. With your translation of those English sentences or English phrases to predicates and similarly definite descriptions to functions and so on. Okay. With that you do the translation. Now, suppose it is a Turing machine, then you have to see what are its fundamental propositions there or fundamental predicates. So, one is a Turing machine can go to the right, come to the left and so on. Right. So, suppose you number the tabs 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on, start from the finite tab, left side cut right side only it is extended, not both the sides that always can be done. Okay. Starting from there, even if you take both the sides you can again manage with negative integers, right? starting from 0. So, let us take 1 to infinity. Now, what you do? 
if it is in some particular place okay then you say where the turing machine is so you say w 5 means now it is scanning the fifth square okay next what you do if it is just fifth square and some uh, transition is applicable which says that go to the right by reading this symbol being in this state right so now you have to say what is the state of the machine what symbol it is scanning so it is in w and it is scanning so and so symbol so for each symbol you have a predicate s of something what is being scanned in which state is it so you write t of something so t of that now you say w of this s of this t of this implies if there is a transition with that thing so you have to introduce a predicate if the transition is such and such then action of the machine means after the next step the machine will be in this configuration right so it will have this state it will be scanning in this square and so on so this can be again represented by the predicates fine so each step of the turing machine can be represented by a predicate now by a formula if such and such predicate satisfied then such and such predicates are satisfied right that's how you will be formalizing the whole turing machine now once the turing machine its functions are given you can just formalize get a consequence now you ask the question whether this turing machine will halt or not so that means the halting state you have to translate now right so it is in particular state h that is again another predicate with h as the argument so halting of a turing machine can be translated therefore you have a consequence this turing machine entails halting state right so this translation is done now once it is done that means halting problem for turing machines is translated as a consequence okay but halting problem is undecidable so consequences will be undecidable right so particularly that consequence that set of consequences what you get from the turing machines will always be undecidable fine so first order logic is undecidable in fact this is the main thing why turing started his turing machines to prove that first order logic is undecidable that's how we got the computers now huh? it came from logic okay so that is the undecidability result of first order logic there is another way of doing it like you may be using so many predicates and other things for translating the turing machines you don't need so much you may need only one binary predicate if there exists a binary predicate in your language first order logic language it's enough to give you undecidability result in contrast if you have a language where only the monadic predicates are there then it is not undecidable it's decidable for example if you have all the all your consequences of this type where you look at the predicates there is one predicate p which is unary another predicate q which is also unary another predicate r which is also unary right all these are unary predicates so suppose you get all consequences which use only unary predicates no function symbols right that is your aristotelian logic monadic logic of uh, aristotle like your aristotelian sentences no all men are mortal socrates is a man therefore socrates is mortal and all those sentences they are all monadic first order logic sentences every predicate there is unary it is also called monadic unary or monadic similarly binary or dadic no? there are some different languages so now what happens if that is so then it is decidable but if there is at least one binary predicate or one function symbol then it will not be decidable fine see its stress can be there in the hurbrand expansions in the hurbrand expansion if you have one function symbol f then you get one infinite domain so stress is found there that probably that will be undecidable that can be proved to be undecidable if there is at least one function symbol or there is at least one binary predicate then also you can show that it is undecidable okay we are not proving that strong result also hmm? but monadic predicates 
if the language only concerns monadic predicates or unary predicates, it is decidable. How do you show it? How do you show that if it is only monadic predicates, then it is decidable? FC arguments do not show it, right? FC says it is recursively enumerable, fine. What about undecidability or decidability? Hmm? and expansion will be finite, right? There is no function symbol, is it not? Suppose like this you have A, there is a constant, B, there is another constant, okay? So, you make the Hurban expansion. What about the equality predicate? Hmm? It is binary, that will create problem. So, in Aristotelian logic, equality predicate is also not there, right. So, there is no problem. You get only a finite number of constants maximum in any consequence. So, you have a domain consisting of those constants only. So, in that domain, you do it, transfer to Hurban expansion that is a finite set, so it is decidable, easy from the Hurban expansions, right. Also, the algorithm was given by Aristotle himself, there is another way of doing it, anyway, we do not need it now, right. So, this is the story about decidability results. So, with this, we stop our uh, discussion or FC, we go to another proof method. Okay. So, what is our next proof method to discuss? Analytic tabula, right. that is what we have not yet discussed. So, we have propositional analytic tabula and now we want first order analytic tabula. So, again it is an extension of propositional analytic tabula, all the connective rules are there whatever we had earlier. Now, we need not confine ourselves to implies for all everything can be tackled there at a time, okay? just like your connectives, all the connectives even top bottom symbols were there in P t. So, to extend it, we need some more rules to for the first order logic specific to it. So, one is your for each rule, okay? this says for each x, x you can derive x, x by t, but then we add something else. Huh? So, which says that the same thing can again be used, because with this one instantiation you may not be able to prove it, you may need some more instantiations. Okay? In practice when we use it, we will not write this, but we will remember we will reuse it. In contrast, if you have there exists, you can instantiate only once, after that you cannot use. Fine? So, we will have there is rule which says there is x x. So, get x x by t, it is not repeated, you cannot use it once more, right. But what is this term t? Now, suppose you have already p c in the premises, you cannot write again c, right. In some context in mathematics, you are doing some problem. So, you say there exists one number between 0 and 1 having such and such property, you say let that be alpha. Now, again you find there exists another number <coughs> within 0 and 1 having some other property say, you cannot say let alpha be that, right, it may not be, it can be some other thing. Okay? So, that is what exactly done, this t should be a new term to the branch, to the path, whole path from the root to that place where it is being applied. It need not be new to the whole tabula till now generated, because all the tabulas are generated only path wise, depth wise. We are doing it breadth wise because of our convenience. By definition, tabula is only depth wise. So, it concerns only through the path, nowhere else. Then it is closed, we go to the next path, that is the way it is being implemented. So, what we do? We say that t is new to the path, new term in the path. We will again say what is the meaning of this new. Right now, we will remember this t means it is a constant, let us say it is a constant, right. It is a new constant that will simplify it. It will need some experience to go for a generalization where you can use terms also, not only constants, any closed terms, any other terms even you can use. Huh, we will see that, 
there are some other constants we will see slowly. So, let us think of this T as a new constant for the time being fine. Similarly, we will have rules for not for all that will say not for each x x you can get not x x by t again t nu it is really existential right not for each really there exists not x. So, we will not write it is equivalent to there exists not x therefore this no double rule is double rule. Huh? So, it will proceed this way then we have not there is which says not there is x x from which you get not x x by t for any term t and also repetition of the rule repetition of the formula it can be used once more. So, these two are really universal rules these two are existential rules. Okay. And there are two more for the equality. So, in equality you have reflexive property of equality which says anywhere you can add t equal to t just as in resolution right it is like an axiom anywhere you can add it and there is substitutivity which says if you have x ok let us start from equality s equal to t x x by s then infer s x by t. Fine. So, here it needs 2 just like your m p's if both the things occur in the path then you can extend the path by adding x x by t. Right. So, these are all the rules extra rules for f t comparing with p t then the same way we will be proceeding as in p t extend the tabula pathwise then once you get negation and uh, that formula itself both in the path close the path right. If the whole tabula is closed then the formulas introduced at the root are inconsistent the set of all those formulas is inconsistent. So, we are proving only inconsistency nothing else then to prove sigma entails w we saw sigma union not w is inconsistent array is a definition now right.